Bob Costas, Football Night in America, Major League Baseball Network. So what's new, Bob? Well, I can see where I'm going again, Dan, since the last time I <laughs> sort of saw you. How often does this come up in conversation when you go out about your pink eye? Uh, every single day, people passing me on the street, strangers, Bob, <laughs> how's the eye? And in some case, eyes, because they realized it, it migrated from left to right. All, all good-natured, all very kind, <laughs> nice concern. And they, they say, gee, we were worried about you, or we felt awful for you, or it must have been the worst timing in history. Well, yeah, it was, but, you know, what the heck. I think you knew, need to do a funnier die on uh, your eye. I, I think I need to be off the radar screen <laughs> on that topic and many others. Because and you and people will come up to you. They think they're the only ones to say something to you about your. Oh, eye, of course, right? It's it's a it's a version of how's the weather up there for <laughs> Kareem or Wilt or whomever. Do you believe that story that Wilt spit on a guy when he said, "Hey, how's the weather up there?" and he spit and said, "It's raining." Did you ever hear that story? Yeah, I. I didn't, and I prefer not to believe it. <laughs> uh, this is Yaseel Puig story. I don't know if you saw the L.A. magazine, but... I didn't. It's, it's incredible. It, it, and I, we had the author on last, last time. He said if half of this is true, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's just how, it, you know, the, the, the lives that are interwoven with Yaseel Puig to get over here with the drug cartel and being kidnapped and coming over on a raft with your girlfriend... 20% of your future earnings go to some shady character in Miami. I mean, this is a movie, Bob. You know, I'm not familiar with the story. I'm going to, as soon as we're done, I'm going to go seek it out. Yeah. Uh, because I don't, I don't have a Dodger game scheduled anytime in the near future. But that's a story you got to know about one of the most important young players in the game. Can you remember somebody who grew up right in front of us? You know, the, the maturation process that was this big. And we're, mm. we're watching them make, you know, Johnny Manziel to a certain degree. We're yeah. watching him do this. But here's Yasiel Puig, who's, you know, he's learning on the job here. Yeah, and there's an element of mystery about him. Now almost everything has been demystified. We knew about Bryce Harper, for example, long before he hit the big leagues. Um, with a guy like Puig, there's intrigue and mystery and conflicting stories. And is this apocryphal or is this true? And you don't have that much of that anymore in American sports. So I think that adds to the fascination about Puig. A couple other items here. Uh, John Farrell got fined an undisclosed amount of uh, money. You know, he complained about replay. And, and I, I like replay. I want them mm-hmm. to get the calls right. I think I, I don't mind them working the kinks out as long as they're going to get it right in the postseason. But there are a couple of times when I'm watching the screen, Bob, and I'm going, how do they not see this? So what, what is missing here with replay in the early goings? I think the way that they have laid it out was about as well thought out as possible. You're right, and other people have said this. There are going to be some flaws in it. They're going to have to work out some of the kinks in it, and it's never going to be perfect. Tony La Russa said that the other day. They are not aiming to get everything perfect. They're aiming to move closer to perfect, but most importantly, never have an obvious, egregiously blown call late in a game, and especially late in a pennant deciding or postseason game. You're never going to have a Don Denkinger call again, which is not only good for fair competition, it's good for Don Denkinger, yeah. who was an excellent umpire and wishes that replay were in place for that call. Jim Joyce wishes that replay were in place and Galarraga hadn't lost his perfect game. That's never going to happen again. Um, but there are potential flaws in it. Um, I, don't, I don't know that they should be reviewing the transfer play. That's always yeah. um, a sketchy play, and maybe that should be left out of it. And there's another play that sort of is in the same category as the neighborhood play, which they're letting go at second base because that's a safety issue, and that's this. A guy slides into second or third. And now he's been called safe, and he's trying to maintain his position on the bag, but he bounces off for a split second, and the guy reapplies the tag. That, to me, sort of seems like it's a neighborhood play thing, that once the guy's been called safe, um, that there should be a moment for him to reestablish himself on the bag. Well, that's what John Farrell was arguing in the Yankee game, and I think you yeah, – this whole unwritten rules – the unwritten rules drive me crazy in baseball, Bob. Well. I mean, the pine tar, 
like you can't have a foreign substance, but it's okay if you have pine tar because the other manager is not going to complain because his pitcher is doing the yeah, same thing. Yeah, because his guys. <laughs> you know, oh, the, the answer to that is Jim Cott's answer from long, long ago. They accused me of ha- having a foreign substance. I absolutely did not. It comes from North Carolina. <laughs> I saw. Um, I also saw a story on Tommy John surgeries that mm-hmm. there seems to be. Um, oh man, it, it's th- that word. Th- like this big tidal wave that came in, and it's common now for Tommy right. John surgery. Almost like, hey, if you blow your arm out, don't worry about it. Tommy John surgery, and you'll be back. Uh, what do you base this on with Tommy John surgeries? And a very high percentage of those who have Tommy John surgery do, in fact, come back. But Tom Berducci has what to now is the definitive take on it and the definitive story on it in Sports Illustrated where he lays it at the feet and there's conclusive evidence of young pitching prospects throwing many innings before they ever enter professional ball um, on travel teams, year-round baseball, throwing many high-stress pitches, 90 miles an hour or more because velocity, what you hit on the gun, is part of what determines what sort of contract you'll be offered, uh, where you'll be drafted. Mm. And those high-stress pitches, not necessarily the number of pitches, he he explains it very well. He uses the example of a rubber band. If you put 100 pounds of pressure on the rubber band, it will snap, let's say, for the sake of this argument. Well, if you're putting 90 or 95 pounds of pressure, it may not snap, but you're incrementally creating little tears in the arm, which over time – is going to catch up with you. On the other hand, if you put 50 pounds of pressure on the arm, uh, then you could throw unlimited pitches, theoretically, without anything ever happening to you. So to him, it wasn't, or by this explanation, it isn't the number of pitches thrown. It's the number of high-stress pitches thrown and how much rest between those pitches. You've got to read the article. I hope I've done a reasonable job of summarizing it. But that, and he has all the statistics, for how, more, how much more frequently that's happening with young pitchers now than it used to be, and the concurrent increase in the number of Tommy John surgeries. He's Bob Costas, Football Night in America, Major League Baseball Network host, joining us to Dan Patrick Show. Uh, paying athletes here, you know, the NCAA, after coincidentally with Shabazz Napier saying, you know, that he, he went hungry right. at night, that the NCAA, which moves at a glacier like pace, says, uh, you know, they get to eat cake. They they get to have everything now. Snacks. Everybody gets unlimited food here. I don't know what this means, Bob. Well, I, where I am in sympathy with the athletes and in theory in sympathy with the Northwestern case is, in effect, working conditions because that's what they are. Uh, how many hours do we have to practice? Uh, what are the rigors of travel? Is it really possible to be a true student athlete under these circumstances. What about a stipend, not a salary, but a stipend that would be the same for the last guy on the team as it is for the guy who wins the Heisman Trophy or is player of the year in in basketball? A stipend, family travel, that kind of thing in the revenue-producing sports, I think, makes sense. But those who glibly say we should pay athletes, I don't think they're looking at the ripple effects. If you pay uh, men's basketball players and football players, then why shouldn't you pay someone on the lacrosse or field hockey team? Why shouldn't you pay swimmers uh, or tennis players? What are the Title IX implications of this? And what about universities like Texas, let's say, or Alabama, who have much larger coffers than many of the teams they compete with? What about private universities who can have one set of rules as against public universities who they play on the court and on the field but who can't keep up under their rules and their restrictions? And to me, the bottom line of all this is When somebody says, well, the universities and the NCAA, they're all benefiting from this, but the players are getting nothing. That's only because we have such a corrupt, fundamentally corrupt uh, sports system in college, at least in most cases, that people look at a scholarship, which is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, which most parents would be thrilled not to have to pay. That is viewed as worthless. Why is it viewed as worthless? Because so many of these kids are going to school with no intention of ever being educated. And the universities know that, too. If you remove that fundamental corruption and force the NFL and NBA to have true farm systems, like hockey and and baseball do, 
And if you only took kids who they don't have to be Rhodes Scholars, but they have to be legitimate students who could meet the minimum standards of whatever university it is, even if they didn't have a football or basketball program, if you only took student athletes, which is now a joke of an expression, but could be uh, legitimate, if you only took student athletes who fit that description, and then if you cut back on the practice, the training, the travel that makes this more professional than a collegiate enterprise, if you put those things back in some sort of normal, sane perspective, then the value of a scholarship under those conditions, plus a reasonable stipend, would be wonderful. And the player who's good enough to leave early or good enough to let, let a guy profit off, off doing a commercial or something, you're not paying him directly, but if you, a local automotive company wants to have a kid in Columbus, Ohio, a place for Ohio State, do something, let them do it. Those things make sense. But you've got to restore an atmosphere where education truly is a valued part of this. And then this whole talk about paying kids, I think, would go away. Stay That's the end of my treatise. Thank you. Good. God, special comment. You went Oberman <laughs> on us there. Several times in my seat. <laughs> Look at this camera. No, I'll come here. Uh, stay healthy, Bob. Uh, I'll try. All right. Bye. Good to talk to you, man. Uh, Bob Costas, NBC Sports.